can honestly say all three. I am a crowd. I am a lonely man. I am nothing. But earlier than 1937, it was Yeats's poetry which told the truest story about the pain of a quarrel with the self, a pain which the later statements, haughty and magnificent as they are, are too rhetorical to register in full. It's not that the pain is somehow put into verse through the agency of form, rather the pain is there, fierce and unbudgeable, deep in the form itself. It's there in the sixth stanza of a prayer for my daughter. May she become a flourishing hidden tree, that all her thoughts may like the linnet be, and have no business but dispensing round their magnanimities of sound. Nor but in merriment begin a chase, nor but in merriment a quarrel. Or may she live like some green laurel, rooted in one dear perpetual place. From its first publication in 1891 until its 15th collected outing in 1923, the first line of Yeats's poem, The Sorrow of Love, had spoken of the quarrel of the sparrows in the eaves. At first sight, the linnet in A Prayer for My Daughter is related to those sparrows with both chase and quarrel, apparently in the realm of merriment. But the older Yeats knows that a quarrel can go far beyond merriment. In 1924, the sorrow of love begins with the brawling of a sparrow in the eaves, keeping for quarrel the deeper resonances of A Prayer for My Daughter. Those resonances are partly with earlier work, such as on one, but largely they sound in the rhyme, quarrel, laurel. The laurel is of course one of the oldest conventional emblems of poetry, or of the condition of being a poet, and for Yeats here it has to come face to face with its rhyme, in quarrel. An early draft, in fact, of the lines gives this confrontation a less figurative cast. When eyes upon a promised face with present faces quarrel, oh, let her live like some green laurel that's rooted in one dear perpetual place. Quarrels that are face to face and are even in some ways about the faces we wear in the world are the worst. And they're both apart from poetry and a part of it, just as one word and another word in rhyme are both detached from and attached to one another. The poet's laurel, in which Yeats unconditionally believes, is always intimate with the quarrel behind and within the poetry. From all of this, it follows that poetry and criticism, like Yeats's poetry and rhetoric, are mutually involved and involving. If they can have a successful relation, that is not to be achieved without other sometimes disastrous or destructive modes of interaction. You cannot just decide that the relationship has to work and declare that it can do so without risk. And yet this is what much criticism, criticism in the literary sphere, and not necessarily just academic writing, believes that it can achieve. Contemporary verse floats in a thin soup of indiscriminate, that is to say, undiscriminating praise and esteem. The unspoken cultural consensus here is one which values respect above all, and to make actual discriminations between, say, good and less good poetry, is to deny verse the respect which is somehow its due. When the difference between texts and personality is hard to make, as it generally is now, the respect to which we rightly believe ourselves entitled as people extends to the reception being accorded to our texts. But a printed text has no automatic right to respect, and all of the respect accorded to it needs to be earned. In the contemporary literary world, it's as though reviewers received new slim volumes with the same sticker on every cover, one which asks simply, do you know who I am? The poetry comes, as it were, from a place of certainty and identity, an imaginative region untroubled by any quarrels it hasn't already won. And it's to be received without quarrel. Above all, nothing in the process should shudder. 
the success of the poetry must find a smooth match in the appreciativeness of its reception and the issues in the poetry, issues which it, which it is likely to be hailed as expressing or even perhaps using poetry in order to express, must be ones which a dominant cultural consensus holds to be worthwhile. We're still, in other words, a long way behind the Yates of a century ago. In some respects, that isn't the least surprising, and the situation is not one to be rectified by some presumptuous and short-sighted proposal that poets and critics should get their acts together and follow his lead. Go thou, as Louis McNeese advised in this context, as long ago as 1941, and do otherwise. And that is still the right course to take. But poetry, nevertheless, has to remember how to quarrel with itself, just as criticism needs to rediscover the power to criticise. A poet's job is to make things, and a critic's task is partly to offer correction. But real making is essential, and real correction. Anything that keys itself to external standards, that lives by a supposedly life-giving consensus beyond art, or at any rate, a livelihood-granting one, is not real poetry and not real criticism. Both things, under such conditions, become passive agents of their time and mere expressions of a zeitgeist, that vacuous but ravenous abstraction in which so much cultural prestige still seems to reside. Against both, we must assert the continued relevance of Yeats's ice and salt, and indeed the continued relevance of Yeats himself. We must not be surprised to be called quarrelsome, but at least we will not knowingly have clipped an angel's wing. Thanks very much.